afternoon. And welcome to our Good Friday services. We thank you for joining us, worshiping God with us this morning, this afternoon. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. He's worthy to be praised. We serve the risen Savior. His name is Jesus. He's King of Kings and He's Lord of Lords. So we invite you right now, even though we can't be together in person, we can worship Him right here.
thank you, God. We thank you. We praise you, God. Let our words and our worship be sweet sound in your ear, God. You're worthy, Jesus. You're great, God. You're great, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're worthy. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you. We love you, God.
amen. We thank God for just being God all by himself. Amen. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is alive and doing well. And today we celebrate Good Friday. And it's important to know why we celebrate Good Friday. And for believers, Good Friday is a crucial day of the year because it celebrates uh, what we believe to be the most momentous weekend in the history of the world. Y'all remember ever since Jesus died and was raised again, uh, Christians have been proclaiming the cross and the resurrection of Jesus to all of creation. And remember the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3, he considered it to be a major of major importance because he talked about the fact that Jesus died for your sins and mine. He was buried and was raised to life on the third day. All in accordance with God's plan. I tell you, God had it already planned. So on Good Friday, we, we remember what Jesus has already done for you and I. And we celebrate that. We remember that. We, we, we can't dare forget it. On the same day this afternoon, we also know that Jesus, while he hung on the cross, he uttered seven last words. Some people say it was utterances. And uh, those statements, those words are major significance because they are the last words of Jesus before his death. And the last words of Jesus demonstrate, listen, that he was consistent in his life and his message until the very end. So having said that, we are blessed this afternoon to hear from seven members of ABC, our church family, and each one of them will be sharing with us what the Holy Spirit has given them to be a blessing to each of us and you and our listeners and social media viewers. Now we'll hear one uh, of the seven last uh, words of Jesus on the cross beginning in this order. We're going to start off with our own uh, anointed associate minister, Minister Gloria Presley. And she'll be coming with the word, first word, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And then secondly, our choir director and worship leader, Sister Tamika Gilbert, will be coming with the second word, today, today thou shalt thou be with me in paradise. Luke chapter 23, 43. At this time, before they come up, we're going to have a selection. Amen.
the Lord, everyone. Get it, 
hands for a while. Jesus knew that deep breathing would send a message to the brain to more the anguish of stress that the body was in in order to calm down from all the distraction of this world. He needed to give his full attention to his father. Mm. Uh, if I could park here for just a second, Jesus is calling for our attention uh, from the stress and the anguish of the distraction of this world. Amen. Jesus is asking, what is distracting you from calling on the Father? He said, I know the stress of this world has overwhelmed you. He said, but I'm calling you, I'm calling you. I want your attention. He said, don't let this distraction hinder you. Don't let the stress and this anguish overpower you. Then he prayed an unselfish prayer concerning the people who were responsible for crucifying him. Father, forgive them. At that moment, from the cross, Jesus began to speak in love to the only one who could deliver him, God himself. He began speaking, not for himself, but for others. And he speaks in love by saying, Father, forgive them, because they know not what they do. Yes. Let me make it plain. Jesus is saying, Father, I know you are just God. And I know you hold them responsible. But Father, this is the reason I came. This is my purpose, Father. It's my destiny. Father, don't be angry or hold this against them. When I say them, I'm talking about the distractions of the life. The distractions of the thieves, yeah. the distractions of the backbiters, the religious leaders, the evildoers, the soldiers. Ah, glory to God. Hallelujah. The Pharisees, the Sadducees. Because in reality, all of us are responsible for Jesus' death. And again, he's saying, Father, forgive them. Because they are ignorant of the device of the evil one. He said, Father, they don't, they don't know. Father, they don't know in whom they're doing this to. Father, they don't know that they're doing this wrong to your son. They don't understand that Satan is using them to carry out his plan. As I hasten to my seat. Jesus inhales the abuse and said, Father, forgive them. Yeah. Jesus inhaled the torture and said, Father, forgive them. Jesus inhales the harsh word and he said, Father, forgive them. And he breathes out new life for us. He breathes out forgiveness. He breathes out peace. He breathes out grace and mercy. Yes. But most of all, he breathes out love. Yes. So breathe in all that life has thrown at you. Yeah. But when you exhale and ask for forgiveness, know that every breath after that will bring new life. Amen. 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 Allow me and 
my church family for just having me the opportunity to be able to bring the second word to you, Jack. The word that I'll be reading from in the NIV is Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And it reads, Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Lord God, I bless you and I honor you today for this opportunity. I ask you, Lord, to please help me to decrease that you might illuminate inside of me, God, that you might come forth to the forefront and bring what you have your people, my sisters and brothers, to hear, God. Help us to be attentive, God. Help me to be clear. Help me not to be so nervous as your Holy Spirit rests upon me, God, in this place. Lord, I thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to bring the thought to you that uh, paradise is a place that we want to go. There was a song back in the day that talked about heaven, don't you want to go, don't you want to go. And, and the connotation of that song is supposed to be enlightenment, a place that's good, a place that's sweet. When someone else was trying to kind of be intimate and have that place with you. But I challenge you to think of that word heaven and place it and replace it with paradise. Don't you want to go to that? So to execute and dissect this passage of scripture, we need to put some context into perspective and understand what was taking place when my Savior spoke these words. We go out, we have awesome leadership here at ABC and some of their mannerisms and some of their behaviors and the things that we say are kind of borrow from, we kind of grow up together. And so context we learn from our past of is extremely important about what is going on before certain words are said. So we want to put into context that Jesus has been sentenced to death by crucifixion. We want to know that crucifixion was a common form of penalty for death in that era of time. Crucifixion is the execution of a person by nailing or binding them to a cross. This crucifixion is the most infamous and draws the most attention because what people didn't realize is that they were actually crucifying God in the flesh. In efforts to degrade the Savior, he was being crucified between two thieves. Now, we already set up the backdrop. God is on the cross. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever had a headache or you're not feeling good, the last thing you're thinking about is someone else. You just want to be by yourself and kind of get yourself to feel better. But Jesus is on the cross. And then it's fresh, we already alluded to. The first thing he did was think about us and was praying for us. So now, here Jesus is. He's beaten, he's bruised, he's blood, he's tired, he's thirsty. He's nailed at the hands and feet to a heavy cross that he had to carry himself to the soul. He is in a position to transition and be united back to the Father. In the wake of his appointed time, the two thieves are expressing their thoughts about Jesus being crucified. I want to just stop there for a moment so we can think about it. Isn't it interesting how people will speculate and pass judgment on others about any given issue in order to take their attention off their own mess? Notwithstanding, they are too being crucified and they're suffering from their own fate. In further study of biblical writings, the Apocrypha, which is an additional literature to support the Bible, it actually names the names of these two things. The one to the left of Jesus was named Justice. The name of the thief on the right was Distance. And if we were to take this scenario and make it live in us today, let's replace those names with our own. Amen. It could be very well one of us sitting here beside Jesus. And this is important to think about because we don't know exactly what it is that those two thieves actually did. We can't say if it was just thievery. It was a few things that you could do that would get you into trouble and have you crucified. And at the time, Rome was in charge of things, so you didn't necessarily have to do anything. If they didn't like you, you could be crucified. But we can put our names in that place. Praise the Lord. Thank you. We can put our names in that place. We don't know what they did to warrant such a horrible and painful death, but we can be certain they were not without sin, and they were wrapped up in iniquity. Are you seeing yourself on the cross beside the Lord, reflecting on the many sins you might have committed unknowingly, and those fully engaged in because you thought it was fun, or you didn't really know any better because you were doing the best that you could at the time, given your situation and your environment? How is it 
that there was nothing to speak of negatively about our Lord, and yet he was placed between these two individuals. The thing that Jesus did was heal the sick. He raised the dead. He poured out compassion and love upon us. He taught us how to do these things for one another. He ate with the sinners. He loved on us so much, and yet he was between these two thieves. Jesus knows all about our circumstances of the living in this world without him being invited to live inside of us. Let's understand that like the two thieves, we can easily find ourselves on one or the other side of Jesus. You can decide for yourself which one you identify more closely with. The thief on the left says to Jesus, if he's the Christ that he claims to be, why don't he get himself down? And while he's at it, get him too. He had the audacity to find himself mocking the Lord our Savior and thinking that he was in the right to be able to come down if he could or to be helped down. Notwithstanding that he wasn't repetitive of the things that he did, notwithstanding that he didn't care about the sins that he may have committed or the people that he hurt or the unjust life that he was living, he just figured that if there's any truth to the things that he heard while people were whispering, he deserved a shot to get down too. But we thank God for Jesus for the thief on the left who reprimanded that thief and he stated that they both deserved to be dying by crucifixion. And he knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus did not deserve that fate. Amen. He further acknowledged the lordship of Christ by, letting him, by asking him to please remember him when he enters into his kingdom. This man didn't blame Jesus for the life he led. He wasn't saying that he was running around being a drug dealer and stealing because daddy wasn't home. He only did the best he could because mama wasn't around at the time and he had to follow the boys. He just simply asked God to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. So the Savior said to him, today, you will be with me in paradise. Does anybody want to go to paradise in spite of the things that they did? I want to go to paradise. I can remember some of the things that I've done that wasn't pleasing to God. I remember some of the questionable choices and decisions that I made. Whether I thought it was justifiable for the environment that I was in, whether it was feeling good to me at the time, or whether I was just trying to get by. When I didn't have Jesus in my life, I just did what I knew to do. But he wasn't blaming God for that. He just wanted to say, he wasn't even asking for no favors. He didn't ask Jesus to get him down. He just wanted to be remembered. Amen. How awesome is God to offer the opportunity to someone like him? Or for those of us who placed our names on those crosses to someone like us and still offer us an opportunity to make it to paradise. So there, we find ourselves. Some of us were fornicators and adulterers. There are still those who are greedy, they're thieves, liars, slanderers, drunks, addicts, also those who identify with LGBTQ+. And just in case you think I'm just being funny or calling out anybody or looking for a group, it's all in the word. It all says that some of us have been one of all of these things in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. So if I didn't hit your street necessarily, best believe it was something that some of us did that didn't line up with what God wanted us to do. And yet, he's on this cross dying for us, offering us an opportunity to make it to paradise. The purpose of highlighting these sins is to magnify the love of Jesus. Whatever the sins and the crimes of the thieves on the right, Jesus forgave him and expressed his love for him by inviting him to paradise with him. Does anybody else want to go to paradise? You know you don't deserve to go, but I just, just in case you might think of all the things that you're not worthy of, how sweet is it that Jesus loved us enough to invite us to go with him? In my closing, as I was preparing for this task to share today, I remember I was caring for my mother who was beginning to transition to paradise herself and to be with Jesus. Her journey was nothing like the Wizard of Oz, where all you had to do was follow the Yellow Brook Road and how sweet it is as we skip to the blue, trying to get to the eyes, and everything was going to be all right. But her road was rocky. Her journey had a lot of trials. She had a lot of hills to climb. She did a lot of things she wasn't proud of, and she knew she wasn't worthy to go with Jesus, but she loved him, and she knew he was real, and all she had to do was call on him, even when she felt that her works, she believed that he told us that he loved us so much, and that he wanted her to be with him, so when she called on him, the Lord came down and grabbed my mama's hand and took her to paradise with him. Oh, I want to go one day. I got to go, because my mom is in paradise.
I mess up much more than I can ever be comfortable with. But God, I know I'm not proud of some things that I do when I continue to mess up. But God, I know that he loves me in a way that I've never been loved before. And even when I feel like my love is sometimes, I can feel him deep down in my soul. So even when I'm feeling unworthy, even when I mess up, even when I think back on the things that I've done, and even the things I don't even know what I'm going to do in my future, but God still loves me enough to invite me to paradise. I'm going to see my parents again. I'm going to see a whole bunch of loved ones again. Don't you want to go to paradise? Don't you want to go to paradise? Let us all lift up the name of Jesus and don't even worry about those sins of the past. He forgot all about them. You should do. Paradise. Don't you want to go? God bless you. Now we'll be blessed with another selection from the ABC Ensemble. And after that, we'll have the third word coming from our faithful servant leader, Deacon Brandon Wilkerson. And then he'll be followed with the fourth word from his lovely anointed wife, Deaconess Erica Wilkerson. God bless you. We thank you, God. You are an evil Lord Jesus. Yes, Only you are holy, only you are wonderful. King of kings and Lord of all, we thank you. Have your way right now.
It's giving time. This is an opportunity for us to uh, transition from being spectators to now being participators. Uh, and we have various ways in which we can give. Uh, the first way we can give, if you want to give your tithes and offering, you can go to our app Easy Tithe, found in your Play Store or your App Store on your smart device. Uh, secondly, you can simply just give by downloading Abyssinian Baptist Church in your App Store or Play Store. Uh, you can give through there as well. Uh, thirdly, you can give by simply just texting. Uh, the number is 267 581 22. Uh, fourthly, fourth way you can give is simply by going to our website, abyssinianbc.com backslash give dash online. Uh, for those that may not be tech savvy and you just want to drop your tithes and offerings off, you can drop it off at our church, Abyssinian Baptist Church, 4210 Germantown Avenue, and our stewards will take care of your offering for you. Uh, lastly, but certainly not leastly, we want to be a blessing to our pastor. Dr. Pointer, who's not on a salary per se, but he's trusting God to touch the hearts of his people to bless him and his family. Uh, you can give that directly if you're here under the sound of my voice, or you can simply just give through Cash App. His handle is dollar sign point two four one. That's dollar sign P O I N T two four one. We thank you for your giving. We bless God for your giving and those that will give in the future. God bless you and heaven smile upon you. Amen. Amen. Verses 26 and 27. Jesus saw his mother and he said to his mother, Mother, behold your sons. And then he turned to his disciples and he said, Sons, behold your mother. If I could title this message today, this message will be called, Am I my brother's keeper? Mm -hmm. Now, when you hear that, it takes you to a lot of different places. But for me, two things came automatically. The first was in Genesis, in chapter four with Cain and Abel. Cain was jealous of his brother, and the Lord came looking and said, Cain, where's Abel? And Cain said to, the, to Jesus, he said, am I my brother's keeper? As if to say, that's not my problem. Why do I have to keep up with him? The second thing took me back to one of my favorite movies, which is New Jack City. And in this movie, Wesley Snipes plays a shady character, we'll go with that, and him and his cohorts are around the table, and he says to them, am I my brother's keeper? And they responded, yes I am. And he said it again, he said, am I my brother's keeper? And they responded, yes. Yes, I am. All throughout the Bible, we see examples of Jesus being a keeper for the, the brothers and sisters of Christ. He raised Lazarus from the dead. There was a blind man who he helped see again. These are all things that he did. Jesus was being a helper. 
He was caring for them for other people. And Matthew in chapter 14, when he calls Peter out into the water, and Peter, at first he's walking and he's going and he's everything's focused, and then all of a sudden he gets distracted and he falls and he cries out, Lord, save me. And what does God do? He re Jesus reached out instantly and he pulled him up. And in that instance, again, he was his brother's keeper. All throughout the Bible, God has shown ways of how we should be with each other, how we should look out for each other, how we should protect each other, and how we should stand up for each other. But these two verses, even though they may seem minor, they pack so much in power. So we'll start with verse 26. And Jesus says, woman, behold thy son. And he was not speaking of himself. Because you have to realize that at this point, Jesus is on the cross. His mother is there, but also the disciples are there. He was saying to her, I've been with you, but now I'm leaving you. Although I'm leaving you, I leave you in good hands. Woman, behold thy son. And the son that he was talking about were the disciples who were right there at the time of his crucifixion. It was for Mary to know, although I may not be here in, the, in flesh, I'll be here in spirit, but my disciples, my disciples will look after you. My disciples will protect you. My disciples will care for you just as I have all this time. In the second half of that, in verse 27, he tells the, the, the disciples, behold thy mother. And what he's saying to them is the title of this message. Am I my brother's keeper? He's saying to them, I'm leaving now, but throughout this time that I've been here, I've been here for you. Even when I've asked you to pray with me and you fell asleep, I've been here with you. When we were on the ship and you were afraid because the waves were throwing the ship left and right and you were scared, you came to me and I've been here for you. Right now, I'm asking you to be here for me. Although I am gone, this woman here is my mother, and you are my brothers in Christ. So therefore, I need you to take care of her while I am gone. What Jesus was doing at this time is he was perfecting and reiterating the golden rule of life, which is found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. And it reads, do to others whatever you would like them to do unto you. So what Jesus is telling us is, don't be quick to judge others because you don't want me to be quick to judge you. Yes. Don't not forgive someone for something they do because you want me to forgive you for everything that you've done. Yes. You want me to be with you. Be with other people. And one thing that comes to mind with this is when people are grieving, how you're there that day, but the grieving process takes a while. And the thing about Jesus is he never leaves our side. And I want to be able to have that the next time that I have to grieve. I know that Jesus is by my side and I want someone else to be by my side so that when the time comes, I can be by their side. The Lord has never left us He's kept us safe. He's been with us at all times. So when he, again, when he says to them, sons, behold your mother, he's saying, please, please take care of this individual. She's precious and she's my mother, but she is also your mother as well. So you have to take care of her once I leave. The one thing we have to realize is that when it's all said and done, the only thing that we have is Jesus. And we do have our family and we have our church family who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we have to stand by them. We need to encourage them. We need to pick them up. Even if they don't know what to do, we need to be the ones to give them that spiritual guidance. We need to be there for them in the time of need and in a time of grief, that's our job because that's what Christ did for us. Yes. The one thing that I hope for is that when I get to heaven 
and God looks at me and he asks me a question. He says to me, Brandon, were you your brother's keeper? I can with confidence and without a shadow of a doubt look at my Lord and Savior and say, yes, yes, my Lord, I was. And then he can respond to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. 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 God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Good afternoon, saints. I have the privilege today to share with you the fourth word. The fourth word of Jesus from the cross can be translated in the Greek to say, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. The fourth word from Jesus from the cross is most commonly known as, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? But if I could put the fourth word of Jesus into my own words, it would be, God, where are you? Where are you? Have you ever been in a season of your life and you feel that you have been forsaken by God? Like you look all around and there's no evidence of his presence or his deliverance. And you cry out, God, where are you? I know I am. There has been, my life has been filled with seasons that I felt forsaken by God. There have been seasons where I was lonely, seasons where I was depressed, seasons where I felt like the people who were for me were against me. There were seasons where I was broke, there were seasons where I was broken, and there were seasons when I didn't know where my help would come from. And during all of these times, my prayer was, God, where are you? The word forsaken can be defined as a feeling of being abandoned or deserted. God, where are you? A little while ago, I saw a movie called The Shack. The movie starts off with a guy who takes his children to his own camping trip. The guy's daughter gets abducted and murdered. Following the daughter's death, the family goes through a series of ups and downs. They go through a lot of heartache. So one day the father gets a letter in his mailbox and it invites him to the shed. The father is first skeptical because he doesn't know if it's a trap by the his daughter's murderer or if it's just an accident. So he accepts the invitation. He accepts it and he goes up there expecting to meet the, uh, the murderer of his daughter. But when he gets there, he has an encounter that he wasn't bargaining for. He doesn't meet her murderer, he meets God. So here's the scene. Him and God are in the kitchen, and he begins to talk to God, and he asks God a simple question. Why? Why my daughter? Why my family? Why do we have to lose like this? The man then gets frustrated with God, and he says, this is the typical behavior of God. When we need him, he's nowhere to be found. He then brings up the cross and he screams at God, you left me and you left your son hanging on the cross. So I know you wouldn't be there for me. I know you wouldn't do it for me. So at any moment you could have changed the course. At any moment you could have changed what happened, but you left him hanging there. And the beautiful thing about God is that God doesn't get angry. He doesn't get upset. He doesn't throw the man out. He simply reaches out his hand. And he says, my son, you have it all wrong. When he was hanging there, I was hanging there also. Earlier this year, my family and I contracted COVID-19. My husband was feeling ill for days, and we thought it was just something that he ate. As the days went on, his symptoms didn't get better. He didn't look any better. And one Sunday, I got up and I went to work, and then I get the call. Babe, I'm going to the hospital. And I said, well, what's going on? Are you fine when you drop me off? You, you seem okay. I, I thought we were, I thought you were going to get better. He said, I, I'm not feeling so well. I have a rash in my body. I need to go. So he goes to the hospital. I go home to tend to our children. And then hours later, he calls and says, babe, 
They think it's COVID. I look at my phone with disbelief. Then I look at my children and I instantly cry out, God, where are you? He came home and he began his quarantine period and it was the hardest day of our life. Hearing my children cry for him, seeing my toddler run up the steps, banging on the door and begging for him to answer, and all we could do was stand there and say, God, where are you? Then days later, discovering that not only did my husband have it, but I had it, my sister had it, and my mother had it too. At this moment, I'm not going to lie, I felt forsaken by God. I felt abandoned, I felt deserted, I was angry, I was frustrated, and I was scared for my life. God, where are you? We did everything right. We sanitized our hands, we wore our masks, we stayed away from people, and we even stayed away from church, and we still call it. Like, God, make it make sense to me. Make it make sense. How could you let this happen? Why did you let this happen to us? God, where are you? A few days in my trunk, my husband began breathing differently. He didn't look so well. He couldn't really walk. He had no strength. So I called his mother and she rushed him back to the hospital. He was there for a little bit and then I got another call. Babe, I gotta go on oxygen. And I had to stay here for just a little while. And I was mad. I was mad that the God that I served would allow this to happen to us. Like, Lord, we love you, we serve you, we obey you, we follow you, but we follow the rules. How could you let this happen to us? So my question is again, God, where are you? As the days and weeks went on, we got stronger, we got better, and praise be to God, we're all here. But if I'm honest today, in that moment, it made me think of all the others that came before it. All the times that I felt forsaken by God. I thought about the time my father left me and my mother to flee to another state to start a family. Then I thought about how my father's parents lived right up the street from us and never came by to see if I needed anything. Then I thought about the time when I fell in third grade and I, and I had to return back to the same school with the people who made fun of me and bullied me. Then I thought about my son. How he was just merely two years old and they labeled him as a problem. They said that he had multiple behavioral issues and that he was beyond help. All of these moments, all of these seasons left me with the same question, God, where are you? Then a few weeks ago, Pastor called me and my husband and said, I would like for you to participate in the seven last word service. When he told me my word, I knew why. I knew why because I could relate to that cry of Jesus. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or in my words, God, where are you? So I began to plan and pray and God gave me two points. Number one, it's not in God's character to forsake his people. Psalms 94 and 14 says, For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. He will never forsake his people. So after I read Psalms 94 and 14, I looked back on those painful moments and I said, But wait a minute, God. You did forsake me. When I was in trouble and I was in pain, you weren't there. You did abandon me. You did forsake me. And his response was, Look again. So I did. I looked again and I began to see how I had never been forsaken by God. Though my father left me, God provided me with a mother who was strong enough to do both. When my grandparents didn't love me, he gave me a maternal grandmother that spoiled me rotten. When I fell in third grade, he gave me teachers like Mrs. Baum, who would not only be my teacher, but my counselor. And then when my son was diagnosed with all of those behavioral disorders, my baby was going in and out of doctor's offices, seeing different psychiatrists. My God aligned me with the right people and told me how to fight and pray. So you see, I've never been forsaken by God. I may have been in trouble, but I was always with God. It always seems that when we're in trouble and when pain comes, that we we think that God has forsaken us. It seems that he has turned a blind eye to our pain and a deaf ear to our prayers. But God has instructed me.
need to tell them today to look again. Look at that situation again. Look at that problem again. Look at that season again. And also look at the cross again. When you look at it, you will notice that God never left you the same way he never left Jesus. He never left you. When you look again, you will notice that he was always by your side. When you look again, you will notice that you were never abandoned. When you look again, you will understand that he always had your best interest at heart. When you look again, you will see that his hand wasn't everything. When you look again, you will see your God has never forsaken you. Being a follower of God does not excuse you from trouble, but it provides assurance that when trouble comes, God will be there also. Psalms 91, 14 to 16 says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life and satisfy him and show him my salvation. Point number two, when we call, he answers. When we call, he answers. The word says that he will call me and I will answer him. God could have changed the course of the cross. God could have changed the outcome for Jesus. God could have changed the story for us. But sometimes he allows trouble so that when we call, he can answer. And today I stop by to tell you that where you are or whatever situation you're in, you're not alone. You're with God. You're with God. So when you cry out, Eli, Eli, Lama Shabbatani, or when you cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or when you keep it all the way real and say, yo, God, where are you? God will boldly respond, here I am. Here I am. I know they say you have cancer, but here I am. I know they say your son has multiple disorders, but here I am. I know your father may have left you, but baby, here I am. I know your grandparents turned their back on you, but here I am. I know the teachers gave up on you, but here I am. I know that you might lose some things in this season, but here I am. You're going through depression, divorce, or a season of rejection, and God says, here I am. Psalms 37 says, I have been young, and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or the children bringing for bread. I've been through some stuff. I've experienced some stuff, but never have I been forsaken by the Almighty. Never have I been forsaken by God. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, you are not forsaken. I truly believe that when Jesus hung there on the cross and he was crying out to God because he wasn't being weak and he wasn't giving up, he wasn't forgetting, he forgot, he didn't forget who his father was. It was because he was reminding God to make good on his promise. He was reminding God that when you recall, you answer. You promise that in trouble you will be there. So the Lord God, here I am, I'm on this cross and you said in your word that you won't forget me. So here I am. And God is saying, I need you to look at the cross again. You thought that he was giving up, but really he was just giving me back my word. He wasn't weak. He wasn't throwing in the towel. He was simply telling God, you promised now I'm cashing in on what you said. God is not a man that he can lie. And if he says that he will never leave you nor forsake you, we must believe him at his word. Today, saints, I need you to get it in your spirit. That I don't know what it looks like in your life. I don't know what you're up against. And I don't know what you're battling. And I don't know what you're dealing with. But God does. And I need you to look again at that situation. And you may feel like you're all alone. And you may feel like that no one's by your side. And God says, look again. I don't forsake my people. I don't roll like that. So if you're fighting for your life or your marriage. Or you're fighting depression. Or you're looking and when you're hanging on the old rugged cross, God says, look again, because there I am also. Today, we must look at this differently. We must begin to stand on the very promises of God and believe whatever he says that he will do, that he will do it. 
You are not in this alone. God is right there. So when you cry out, Eli, Eli, Lama Shabbatani, or when you cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or when you say, God, where are you? God will boldly respond, daughter, son, here I am. Amen. What a time, what a time, what a time we've been having. At this time, we're going to have another selection from the ABC Ensemble. Following the selection, we're going to hear a fifth word from our own uh, wellness director, Brother Jonas Floyd. Following him, we'll have a sixth word representing the ABC Women's Ministry from my daughter-in-law, Sister Danielle Pointer. And then the seventh and final word will be coming from the Holy uh, Spirit anointed and dynamic gospel preacher, my son, Reverend Richard Pointer. To God be the glory.
Thank you, Ensemble, for a great selection. First, I would like to thank Pastor for allowing me the opportunity of delivering one of the seven last words. The one that was assigned to me was I Thirst, which is the fifth of the series of the seven last words. And the address for I Thirst comes from John 19.28. I would like to first start out with my title Who's thirsty? Who's thirsty? As we go over the fifth phrase that Jesus spoke on the cross, I just wonder, why would he say, I thirst? Was he really thirsty? How could he be thirsty with everything that he was going through? Was that the only thing on his mind at the time? Was he just showing his humanity? I would like to point out three things in this moment that Jesus displayed while experiencing his last time as a human. In this moment, he was able to maintain and accomplish the goals God set out for him without divine intervention. The three ideas I would like to talk about for, a ne for the next few minutes is sacrifice, love, and mercy. So the first question is, what is sacrifice? Although there are many definitions, there's one that speaks out the loudest, and it is an act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. When you look back on the scenario of Jesus' experience, there was much sacrifice that took place. The greatest sacrifice that he gave was of himself to eliminate the barrier separating us from our future with him. Another sacrifice is that in his human form, being tortured, being mistreated, being abused, he did not try to escape from the plan or give up the plan. In this, he displayed perfect self-control, discipline, and focus. When you physically become exerted, you sweat, you get tired. At a point, you start thinking about how close the end is, which is normally a, self, a selfish thought. But as Jesus became exerted on the cross, he not only was exerted physically, but emotionally and spiritually and mentally. As he was losing blood, as he was as he was sweating, as he was losing water from the wounds that he inf uh, was inflicted on him, he chose first to deny the first attempt of providing him with wine that would be mixed with pain medicine. In the scriptures, it talks about as anyone who uh, is crucified, they offer a wine that's mixed with something that is considered myrrh, and in that it dulls the pain so that they can endure the crucifixion for longer. But not Jesus. He gave up that attempt of pacifying his pain so that he can have a clear mind of the goals that were in front of him and the prophecy that he needed to fulfill. Therefore, he sacrificed his own needs to make sure he was fully aware of what was going on and he didn't accept anything to drink until after the prophecy was complete. Secondly, sacrifice sometimes comes easier when you're doing it for a reason or for something or someone you love. The love Jesus possesses for us was established before we were even born. As 1 Corinthians says about, talks about love, it says, from 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. And God, who is love, 1 John 4, 8, thought enough of us 
that he planned to give up himself just to bring a connection back that we broke. In his word, he speaks of how much he loves us, that he sacrifices his only son. John 3.16 For people who did not deserve any of it, he gave of himself. However, thank God for the love of love, because where would we be if he decided, you know what? I don't think they deserve to have another chance after what they pulled in the garden. God has literally remained true to his word about love and providing salvation, just as another example. 1 Peter 4 and 8 and John 15, 13. Thirdly, the love that Jesus has for us leads me to my last point of mercy that he gave us continuously and he continues to give us today. And Lamentations 3, 22, 23 says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thirdly, the love that Jesus has for us leads me to my last point of mercy. He gave us continuous mercy on the cross and as we uh, live out our lives today. As we refer to Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So that just pretty much states that the mercy that he gives us is new every single day. Mercy, by definition, is withholding or seizing punishment for someone who does deserve it. In the midst of his plan, we messed up. We sinned. After God carried out his plan, we continued to sin. And even this is enough. God knew before we were conceived that we were going to mess up and sin. So I will get God's sacrifice and invest time in people who he knew needed so much mercy. Why would God display this type of mercy to those who continuously hurt him and disobey his instructions? Well, it is stated in Romans 8, 38 and 39 that because of his love for us, there's nothing that will keep us from him. So as we think about God's love, sacrifice and mercy we still ask the question what does that have to do with thirst thirst is just a physical feeling that your body goes through and i would say yes you're right but what if god was not just thirsty in his physical form but what if god wanted to quench his thirst of reconnecting us together with him what if god's thirst was so great that he couldn't go without a future with us because he loved us so much we already know, according to John 14 and 6, that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven and there is no other positive alternative. I believe Jesus was thirsty. I believe his thirst started back in the garden when we slipped up in sin and sin entered into the world. I believe Jesus was thirsty when he waited for the right time to enter into this place where he would not be accepted. I believe that Jesus was thirsty and remains thirsty until the plan was completed or accomplished. Ultimately, I'm glad Jesus was thirsty for us because I would hate to think of what life in the future would be like if he wasn't. Um, how can I start this? I want to first uh, say thank you to Pastor for even considering me because he definitely texted me and I didn't respond. And he took my no response as a yes. So I just wanna, <laughs> I wanna thank him for the opportunity and, and trust in me to bring forth the sixth word, which is, it is finished. And this word comes from John 19, verse 30. It's said, in John 19, 30 says, when Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. 
Then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. If I could title this message, I would like to title it, Jesus Paid It All. Jesus saying it is finished is a unique statement. And what makes this so unique is that it's a cry of victory. It is finished is a triumphant cry that what I came to do has been done. All is accomplished, all is completed, and all is fulfilled. Jesus makes this victorious statement from a position of pain and agony while hanging on the cross. From the outside, he looked like he was defeated. And it looked like the enemy had won. But I'm so glad that God has the final say. Amen. Have you ever been in a place that it appeared like you weren't going to make it and it seemed like everything was stacked against you? But God stepped in and showed you that he was in control. A lot of times, many of us probably say that I am finished. But when you get to that moment and in that instant, don't say I am finished, but change that I am to it is because Jesus took care of it for us. Jesus wants us to not focus on our circumstances, but focus on the purpose he has given us. Jesus' goal while he was here on earth was to finish the work that God gave him to do. Totelestai is a common word that was used in the Roman culture, meaning it is finished. A servant would use totelestai, meaning that a task was completed. A judge would use that word as justice has been served. An accountant would use it as the debt has been paid in full. And the artist would use it as the picture is finished. And the priest would use it as the perfect offering has been given. When Jesus was on the cross and bowed his head and said that it is finished, you may wonder what was finished. Well, here are three things that were finished. He fulfilled the promises. He satisfied God's justice. And he paid off the debt that was owed to God. Let me repeat those three things for you one more time. He fulfilled the promises. He satisfied God's justice. And he paid off the debt that was owed to God. Point number one. The promise that Jesus fulfilled was that he died on the cross for our sins and stayed on that cross until every sin was paid for. He died on the cross so that people of God would be saved that the justice of God will be satisfied and that the love of God will be revealed. Point number two, Daniel R. Hyde states that God's justice requires that each and every one of our sins we have committed against him be, be punished with temporal and eternal punishments of soul and body. Jesus took the eternal punishment for us when he was on the cross. How did he take our punishment? Well, when they pierced him on his side, that was our punishment. When they put nails in his hands, that was for our punishment. And when they put a crown of thrones on his head, that was for our punishment. I know that most of us can't even bear the pain of a paper cut. But to endure what Jesus did, we wouldn't have lasted one minute. According to Isaiah 53, 11, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to count to righteous, for he will bear all their sins. And point number three, Jesus paid off the debt owed to God. God made each and every one of us to love, honor, and obey him in thought, word, and deed. When we fail to do that, we accrue a debt to God. Jesus is our go-to person that stands between us and God and goes to God on our behalf to come up with a res resolution that God will find acceptable. Jesus is our Redeemer and he is willing to intercede for us and pay our debt to God the Father. Colossians 2.14 states that we owe the debt because we broke God's laws. That debt is to all the rules we fail to follow. But God forgave our debt, and he canceled our debt by nailing it to the cross. In closing, imagine you're out with a good friend, enjoying lunch, having a great time, and here comes the waiter with your bill. All of a sudden, someone comes over and pays your bill. You have never met the person before. You've never seen them a day in your life. But here they are paying your bill for your lunch. That is just how Jesus is. 
He loves us so much that he took on all of our sins and took them on the cross for them. Jesus has truly, truly paid it all. All to him we owe. And even though sin has left a crimson stain, Jesus washed them and made us all white as snow. Seven sayings by saying, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do, showing the connection or intimacy between him and his father. And it's somewhere in the middle of the crucifixion. The connection is lost. And he turns from father, father, to now say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But I'm so glad that things that have been disconnected before can now be reconnected. Amen. Amen. And after Jesus says, it is finished, we see the relationship between him and his father have been reconnected. And he says, Father, into my hands, thy hands, I commit my spirit. And that word commit in the Greek is paraphemia, which means para, which means beside, and thema, which means to place. It means literally to place beside. Jesus uses the middle voice here, which is interesting because in secular Greek, paraphemia in the middle voice was a term given for something to something to someone in trust for safekeeping. God the Son entrusted himself to God the Father's hands. In other words, Jesus is saying, no better hands I'd rather be in than the hands and the arms of my Father. Amen. Because when I was in other people's hands, I, when I was in Pilate's hands, when I was in the hands of the Sanhedrin, they, they beat me. They, 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 they put nails on my head. They, they put uh, uh, crown of flame. They nails on my head. They put nails in my arms and my feet. Uh, 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 they touched me to an old rugged cross. So I'd rather be in your hands, Jesus. Yeah. I'm tired of being in the hands of the wrong people. Yeah. People who use and abuse me. If the problem is, is that many of us, when problems come, we run to the wrong hands. Amen, somebody. Somebody runs to the hands of their bank account. Amen. Somebody goes to an unhealthy relationship. Some people go to the uh, Facebook or Twitter or IG to tell all of their business. And the problem is, is that these people and platforms aren't safe, but they're a place where you get exploited and take advantage of. Amen, somebody. And Jesus is saying that all state insurance won't keep you safe. But the hands of my Father is the only place where you'll get blessed assurance. Amen, somebody. Amen. And when Jesus said, into your hands I commit my spirit, he was quoting Psalm 31 and 5. Every Jew around the cross would recognize these words because they prayed these regularly. This was a nighttime prayer. It's sort of similar to how we were raised. Remember the prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my Lord the soul to keep it. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was what they were familiar with. Amen. So into thy hands I commit my spirit. But Jesus makes some changes to this prayer. And the first change is he adds Father back to this prayer. To show that the brokenness of the past few hours have now ended. He's no longer forsaken and the wrong, no longer he's in darkness. No longer the curse and the wrath of God and the punishment is over. The suffering is finished. Sweet communion with his father once again. But secondly, he also leaves off this prayer, redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Why? Because Jesus is the redeemer. He doesn't need to be redeemed. Because don't forget, both heaven and earth proclaim his perfection. His holiness, his sinlessness. Jesus is absolutely righteous in all his ways. In everything Jesus did and said, he fulfilled the will and the word of God. Even with death in sight, Jesus still was sensible of his purpose. The lesson here is that no matter what we're facing, no matter the degree, meaning how hot of a situation that we're in, and many of us are going to find ourselves, if you aren't in one now, in some hot situations, amen. amen? No matter how much the degree of the situation you're in, no matter how much the depth or how deep you're in the problem, amen, somebody, or the level of discomfort that we may rely on, uh, we, at the end of the day, may rely on God's word to get us through. Amen, somebody. No matter the degree, no matter the depth, or matter, no matter the discomfort level, we can always depend on God to see us through. Amen. Amen. And things change when you put things in God's hands. Uh, when Satan thought that you would be defeated, in God's hands it turned into your deliverance. Amen. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Amen. Uh, uh, what Satan meant for your shame, in God's hands it turned into a success. Yeah, yeah. What Satan thought would have weighed you down and 
And then God says it, guess what? It picks you back up. Uh, what Satan thought would be your midnight. In God's hands, it turned into morning. And weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come indeed in the morning. Amen. What Satan thought would have you limping and staggering, in God's hands will have you leaping and shouting. Uh, what God was saying for would be a stumbling block. In God's hand turned into a stepping stone. Yeah. Uh, when Satan thought that you would be the victor, in God's hands you are now the victor. Yeah. Uh, all I'm here to tell you is that everything that you put in God's hands will be success. Yeah. I'm no longer going to put it in anybody else's hand. I put it all in his hands. Yeah. And the song says all in his hands. I put it Thanksgiving. 
Let all God's people say amen. 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 And amen. amen. I hope you were blessed. I know you were. It was a great word that went forth by everybody. We thank you. Each and every participant will allow the Lord to use you in your own unique way. We know that God's work will not return void, but will accomplish what it's set out to do. We thank you for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you on Sunday for Easter Sunday. Amen. Amen. Or Resurrection Sunday. Because he got up. And because he got up, we can get up as well. Amen. God bless you. And have a smile upon you. Amen.